Prologue from Troilus and Cressida by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Charlene V. Smith. In Troy there lies the scene. From isles of Greece the princes Orgulus, their high blood chafed, have to the port of Athens sent their ships, fraught with the ministers and instruments of cruel war. Sixty and nine that wore their crown its regal, from the Athenian bay put forth toward Phrygia, and their vow is made to ransack Troy, within whose strong immures the ravished Helen, Menelaus queen, with wanton Paris sleeps, and that's the quarrel. To Tenedos they come, and the deep-drawing barks do there disgorge their warlike frottage. Now on Darden plains, the fresh and yet unbruised Greeks do pitch their brave pavilions. Priam's six-gated city, Darden and Timbria, Elias, Cetus, Trojan, and Antonorides, with massy staples and corresponsive and fulfilling bolts, spur up the sons of Troy. Now expectation, tickling skittish spirits on one and other side, Trojan and Greek, sets all on hazard. And hither am I come, a prologue armed, but not in confidence of author's pen or actor's voice, but suited in like conditions as our argument, to tell you, fair beholders, that our play leaps o'er the vaunt and firstlings of those broils, beginning in the middle, starting thence away to what may be digested in a play. Like, or find fault, do as your pleasures are. Now good or bad, tis but the chance of war. End of prologue from Troilus and Cressida. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Charlene V. Smith. The Advice to the Players from Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, Act 3, Scene 2, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Brian Lee Rosso, October 9, 2007. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of your players do, I had as lief the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand thus, but use all gently. For in the very torrent, tempest, and, as I may say, the whirlwind of passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Oh, it offends me to the soul to hear a robustious periwig-painted fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, who for the most part are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noise. I could have such a fellow whipped for or doing termagant. It out Herod's Herod. Pray you, avoid it. Be not too tame neither, but let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance, that you o'erstep not the modesty of nature, for anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time his form and pressure. Now, this overdone, or come tardy off, though it make the unskilful laugh, cannot but make the judicious grieve. 
the censure of the which one must, in your allowance, or weigh a whole theatre of others. Oh, there be players that I have seen play, and heard others praise, and that highly, uh, not to speak it profanely, that neither having the accent of Christians, nor the gait of Christian, pagan, nor man, have so strutted and bellowed that I have thought some of nature's journeymen had made men, and not made them well. They imitated humanity so abominably. Oh, reform it altogether! But let those that play your clowns speak no more than is set down for them. For there be of them that will themselves laugh, to set on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh too. Though, in the meantime, some necessary question of the play be then to be considered. That's villainous, and shows a most pitiful ambition in the fool that uses it. Go, make you ready. This concludes the advice to the players from Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. Act Three, Scene Two. This recording is in the public domain. Thou knowest the mask of night is on my face. From Romeo and Juliet, Act Two, Scene Two by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caitlin Cooper. Thou knowest the mask of night is on my face, else would a maiden blush bepaint my cheek for that which thou hast heard me speak to night. Fain would I dwell on form, fain, fain deny what I have spoke, but farewell compliment. Dost thou love me? I know thou wilt say I, and I will take thy word. Yet if thou swearest thou mayest prove false, at lovers' pejures, then say, Jove laughs. O oh, gentle Romeo, if thou dost love, pronounce it faithfully, or if thou thinkest I am too quickly won, I'll frown and be perverse and say thee nay, so thou wilt woo, but else not for the world. In truth, fair Montague, I am too fond, and therefore thou mayest think my haviour light. But trust me, gentleman, I'll prove more true than those that have more cunning to be strange. I should have been more strange, I must confess, but that thou overheardest ere I was ware of my true love's passion. Therefore pardon me, and not impute this yielding to light love, which the dark night hath so discovered. End of Thou knowest the mask of night is on my face. From Romeo and Juliet, Act Two, Scene Two. This recording is in the public domain. O oh, spite, O oh, hell, I see you all are bent, from A Midsummer Night's Dream, Act Three, Scene Two, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Victoria Clark. O oh, spite, O oh, hell, I see you all are bent, set against me for your merriment. If you were civil and knew courtesy, you would not do me thus much injury. Can you not hate me as I know you do? But you must join in souls to mock me too. If you were men as men you are in show, you would not use a gentle lady so, to vow and swear and superpraise my parts, when I am sure you hate me with your hearts. You both are rivals and love Hermia, and now both rivals to mock Helena. A trim exploit, a manly enterprise, to conjure tears up in a poor maid's eyes, with your derision none of noble sort, would so offend a virgin and extort a poor soul's patience, all to make you sport. End of O oh Spite, O oh Hell, I See You All Abent, from A Midsummer Night's Dream, Act Three, Scene Two, by William Shakespeare. This recording is in the public domain. I know a bank where the wild time blows. From A Midsummer Night's Dream, Act Two, Scene One, by William Shakespeare. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Shirtigal. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where ox lips and the nodding violet grows, quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses and with eglantine. There sleeps Titania, sometime of the night, lulled in these flowers with dances and delight. 
And there the snake throws her enameled skin, Weed wide enough to wrap a fairy in. And with the juices of this I'll streak her eyes, And make her full of hateful fantasies. Take thou some of it, and seek through this grove, A sweet Athenian lady is in love With a disdainful youth. Anoint his eyes, but do it when the next thing he espies May be the lady. Thou shalt know the man by the Athenian garments he hath on. Affect it with some care, that he may prove more fond on her than she upon her love. And look thou meet me ere the first cock crow. End of I Know a Bank Where the Wild Time Blows. This recording is in the public domain. Farewell, God knows when we shall meet again. From Romeo and Juliet, Act Four, Scene Three, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caitlin Cooper. Farewell, God knows when we shall meet again. I have a faint, cold fear thrills through my veins that almost freezes up the heat of life. I'll call them back again to comfort me. Nurse, what should she do here? My dismal scene I needs must act alone. Come, vile. What if this mixture do not work at all? Shall I be married then to-morrow morning? No, no, this shall forbid it. Lie thou there. What if it be a poison, which the friar subtly hath ministered to have me dead, lest in this marriage she should be dishonoured, because he married me before to Romeo? I fear it is. And yet, methinks, it should not, for he hath still been tried a holy man. How if, when I am laid into the tomb, I wake before the time that Romeo come to redeem me? There is a fearful point. Shall I not, then, be stifled in the vault, to whose foul mouth no health-stone air breathes in, and there die strangled ere my Romeo comes? Or, if I live, is it not very like? the horrible conceit of death and night, together with the terror of the place, as in a vault an ancient receptacle, where, for these many hundred years, the bones of all my buried ancestors are packed, where bloody Tybalt, yet but green in earth, lies festering in his shroud, where, as they say, at some hours in the night spirits resort. Alack, alack, it is not like that I, so early waking, what with loathsome smells and shrieks like mandrakes torn out of the earth, that living mortals hearing them run mad, oh, if I wake, shall I not be distraught, environed with all these hideous fears, and madly play with my forefather's joints, and pluck the mangled Tybalt from his shroud, and in this rage with some great kinsman's bone, as with a club, dash out my desperate brains? Oh, look, methinks I see my cousin's ghost, seeking out Romeo that did spit his body upon a rapier's point. Stay, Tybalt, stay. Romeo, I come. This do I drink to thee. End of Farewell, God Knows When We Shall Meet Again From Romeo and Juliet, Act 4, Scene 3 This recording is in the public domain. Over hill, over dale, through bush, through briar, from a midsummer night's dream, Act Two, Scene One, by William Shakespeare, recording by Caitlin Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Over hill, over dale, through bush, through briar, over park, over pale, through flood, through fire. I do wander everywhere, swifter than the moon's sphere, and I serve the fairy queen to do her orbs upon the green. How slips tall her pensioners be, in their gold coat spots you see. Those be rubies' fairy favors, in those freckles live their savors. I must go seek some dewdrops here, and hang a pearl in every cowslip's ear. Farewell, thou lob of spirits, I'll be gone. Our queen and all our elves come here and on. End of Over Hill, Over Dale, Through Bush, Through Briar From A Midsummer Night's Dream, Act Two, Scene One This recording is in the public domain. O all you host of heaven, O earth, what else? 
From Hamlet, Act One, Scene Five, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caitlin Cooper. Oh, all you hosts of heaven, O oh, earth, what else? And shall I couple hell? Oh, fie! Hold, hold, my heart, and you, my sinews, grow not instant old, but bear me stiffly up. Remember thee. Ay, thou poor ghost, while memory holds a seat in this distracted globe, remember thee. Yea, from the table of my memory I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all saws of books, all forms, all pressures past, that youth and observation copied there. And thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with baser matter. Yes, by heaven, O most pernicious woman! O oh, villain, villain, smiling damn villain! My tables, meet it is I set it down, that one may smile and smile and be a villain. At least I'm sure it may be so in Denmark. So, uncle, there you are. Now to my word, it is I do, I do. Remember me, I have sworn it. End of O oh, All You Hosts of Heaven, O oh, Earth, What Else? From Hamlet, Act One, Scene Five. This recording is in the public domain. Hecate's Monologue from Macbeth, Act 3, Scene 5, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. Have I not reason, beldams as you are, saucy and overbold? How did you dare to trade and traffic with Macbeth in riddles and affairs of death? And I, the mistress of your charms, the close contriver of all harms, was never called to bear my part or show the glory of our art? And which is worse, all you have done hath been but for a wayward son. Spiteful and wrathful, who as others do, loves for his own ends, not for you. But make amends now, get you gone, and at the pit of Archeron meet me in the morning. Thither he will come to know his destiny. Your vessels and your spells provide, your charms and everything beside. I am for the air. This night I'll spend unto a dismal and fatal end. Great business must be wrought ere noon. Upon the corner of the moon there hangs a vaporous drop profound. I'll catch it ere it come to ground. And that distilled by magic slights shall raise such artificial sprites as by the strength of their illusion shall draw him on to his confusion. He shall spurn, fate, scorn, death, and bear his hopes above wisdom, grace, and fear. And you all know security is mortal's chiefest enemy. End of Hecate's Monologue from Macbeth, Act 3, Scene 5. This recording is in the public domain. My Mistress with a Monster is in Love From A Midsummer Night's Dream, Act 3, Scene 2 By William Shakespeare This is a LibriVox recording. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Rhonda Fetterman My Mistress with a Monster is in Love Near to her close and consecrated bower While she was in her dull and sleeping hour a crew of patches, rude mechanicals, that work for bread upon Athenian stalls, were met together to rehearse a play, intended for great Theseus's nuptial day. The shallowest thick-skin of that barren sort, who Pyramus presented in their sport, forsook his scene and entered in a break, when I did him at this advantage take. An ass's knoll I fixed on his head, Anon his thisbe must be answered, and forth my mimic comes, 
when they him spy as wild geese that the creeping fowler's eye or russet pated chuffs many in sort rising and cawing at the gun's report sever themselves and madly sweep the sky so at his sight away his fellows fly and at our stamp here o'er and o'er one falls he murder cries and help from athens calls their sense thus weak lost with their fears thus strong made senseless things begin to do them wrong for briars and thorns at their apparel snatch some sleeves some hats some yielders all things catch i led them on in this distracted fear and left sweet pyramus translated there when in that moment so it came to pass titania waked and straightway loved an ass end of my mistress with a monster is in love from a midsummer night's dream act three scene two this recording is in the public domain. Caesar, I Never Stood on Ceremonies from Julius Caesar, Act Two, Scene Two, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. What mean you, Caesar? Think you to walk forth? You shall not stir out of your house today. Caesar, I never stood on ceremonies. Yet now they fright me. There is one within, beside the thing we have heard and seen, recounts most horrid sights seen by the watch. A lioness hath whelped in the streets, and graves have yawned and yielded up their dead, fierce fiery warriors fought upon the clouds in ranks and squadrons in right form of war which drizzled blood upon the capital the noise of battle hurtled in the air horses did neigh and dying men did groan and ghosts did shriek and squeal about the streets o oh, caesar these things are beyond all use and i do fear them when beggars die, there are no comets seen. The heavens themselves blaze forth the death of princes. Alas, my lord, your wisdom is consumed in confidence. Do not go forth today. Call it my fear that keeps you in the house, and not your own. We'll send Mark Antony to the Senate House, and he shall say you are not well today. Let me upon my knee prevail in this. End of Caesar. I never stood on ceremonies. From Julius Caesar, Act Two, Scene Two. This recording is in the public domain. Rebellious Subjects, Enemies to Peace, from Romeo and Juliet, Act 1, Scene 1, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nathan Pilling. Rebellious Subjects, Enemies to Peace, Profaners of this neighbor stained steel, Will they not hear? What ho, you men, you beasts, That quench the fire of your pernicious rage, with purple fountains issuing from your veins. On pain of torture from those bloody hands, throw your mistempered weapons to the ground, and hear the sentence of your moved prince. Three civil brawls, bred of an airy word, by thee, old Capulet and Montague, have thrice disturbed the quiet of our streets, and made Verona's ancient citizens, cast by their grave beseeming ornaments, to wield old partisans in hands as old, cankered with peace to part your cankered hate, if ever you disturb our streets again, your lives shall pay the forfeit of the peace. For this time all the rest depart away. You, Capulet, shall go along with me, and Montague come this afternoon, to know our further pleasure in this case. To old Freetown our common judgment place. Once more, on pain of death, all men depart. 
Rebellious Subjects, Enemies to Peace, from Romeo and Juliet, Act 1, Scene 1. This recording is in the public domain. Adriana's Speech to Antiphilus, from the Comedy of Errors, Act Two, Scene Two, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Ay, ay, Antiphilus, look strange and frown. Some other mistress hath thy sweet aspects. I am not Adriana, nor thy wife. The time was once when thou unurged wouldst vow that never words were music to thine ear, that never object pleasing in thine eye, that never touch well welcome to thy hand, that never meat sweet savoured in thy taste, unless I spake, or looked, or touched, or carved to thee. How comes it now, my husband? Oh, how comes it, that thou art thus estranged from thyself? Thyself, I call it, being strange to me. That undividable, incorporate, am better than thy dear self's better part. Ah, do not tear away thyself from me. For know, my love, as easy mayest thou fall a drop of water in the breaking gulf, and take unmingled that same drop again, without addition or diminishing, as take from me thyself, and not me too. How dearly would it touch me to the quick, shouldst thou but hear I were licentious, and that this body, consecrate to thee by ruffian lust should be contaminate! Wouldst thou not spit at me, and spurn at me, and hurl the name of husband in my face, and tear the stained skin off my harlot brow, and from my false hand cut the wedding ring, and break it with a deep divorcing vow? I know thou canst, and therefore see thou do it. I am possessed with an adulterate blot, my blood is mingled with the crime of lust, for if we two be one, and thou play false, I do digest the poison of thy flesh, being strumpeted by thy contagion. Keep then far league and truce with thy true bed. I live unstained, thou undishonoured. End of Adriana's Speech to Antipholus From the Comedy of Errors, Act Two, Scene Two This recording is in the public domain. Isabella's Soliloquy, from Measure for Measure, Act Two, Scene Four, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. To whom should I complain? 
Did I tell this? Who would believe me? O oh, perilous mouths! that bear in them one and the self-same tongue, either of condemnation or proof, bidding the law make curtsy to their will, hooking both right and wrong to the appetite to follow as it draws. I'll to my brother, though he hath fallen by prompture of the blood, yet hath he in him such a mind of honour, that had he twenty heads to tender down on twenty bloody blocks, he'd yield them up, before his sister should her body stoop to such abhorred pollution. Then, Isabel, live chaste, and, brother, die. More than our brother is our chastity. I'll tell him yet of Angelo's request, and fit his mind to death for his soul's rest. End of Isabella's Soliloquy from Measure for Measure, Act Two, Scene Four. This recording is in the public domain. Portia's Speech to Brutus from Julius Caesar, Act Two, Scene One, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Is Brutus sick? And is it physical to walk unbraced and suck up the humours of the dank morning? What? Is Brutus sick? And will he steal out of his wholesome bed, to dare the vile contagion of the night, and tempt the roomy and unpurged air to add unto his sickness? No, my Brutus. You have some sick offence within your mind, which, by the right and virtue of my place, I ought to know of. And upon my knees I charm you, by my once commended beauty, by all your vows of love, and that great vow which did incorporate and make us one, that you unfold to me, yourself, your half, why you are so heavy, and what men to-night have had to resort to you, for here have been some six or seven, who did hide their faces even from darkness. I should not need if you were gentle, Brutus. Within the bond of marriage, tell me, Brutus, is it accepted that I should know no secrets that appertain to you? Am I yourself but, as it were, in sort or limitation, to keep with you at meals, comfort your bed, and talk to you sometimes? Dwell I but in the suburbs of your good pleasure? If it be no more, Portia is Brutus's harlot, not his wife. If this were true, then should I know this secret. I grant I am a woman, but withal a woman that Lord Brutus took to wife. I grant I am a woman, but withal a woman well reputed, Cato's daughter. Think you I am no stronger than my sex, being so fathered and so husbanded? Tell me your counsels, I will not disclose them. I have made strong proof of my constancy giving myself a voluntary wound, here, in the thigh. Can I bear that with patience, and not my husband's secrets? End of Portia's Speech to Brutus, from Julius Caesar, Act Two, Scene One. This recording is in the public domain. Is he not approved in the height of villain from Much Ado About Nothing? Act four, scene one, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Karen Savage. Is he not approved in the height of villain that hath slandered, scorned, dishonoured my kinswoman? Oh, that I were a man! What? Bear her in hand until they come to take hands, and then with public accusation, uncovered slander, unmitigated rancour! Oh, 
God that I were a man! I would eat his heart in the marketplace! Talk with a man out at a window! A proper saying! Sweet hero! She is wronged! She is slandered! She is undone! Princes and counties! Surely a princely testimony! A goodly count, count comfect! A sweet gallant, surely! Oh, that I were a man for his sake! Oh, that I had any friend would be a man for my sake! But manhood is melted into courtesies, valour into compliment, and men are only turned into tongue and trim ones, too! He is now as valiant as Hercules, that only tells a lie and swears it. I cannot be a man with wishing. Therefore I will die a woman with grieving. End of Is He Not Approved in the Height a Villain? From Much Do About Nothing. Act 4, Scene 1. This recording is in the public domain. Methinks I am a prophet new inspired. From King Richard the Second, Act Two, Scene One, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Methinks I am a prophet new inspired. And thus, expiring, do foretell of him. His rash, fierce blaze of riot cannot last, For violent fires soon burn out themselves. Small showers last long, but sudden storms are short. He tires betimes that spurs too fast betimes. With eager feeding, food doth choke the feeder, Light vanity, insatiate cormorant, Consuming means soon preys upon itself. This royal throne of kings, This sceptred isle, This earth of majesty, This seat of Mars, This other Eden, demi-paradise, This fortress built by nature for herself Against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall, or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England, this nurse, this teeming womb of royal kings, feared by their breed and famous by their birth, renowned for their deeds as far from home, for Christian service and true chivalry, as is the sepulchre in stubborn jewellery of the world's ransom, blessed Mary's son. This land of such dear souls, this dear, dear land, Dear for her reputation through the world, is now leased out, I die pronouncing it, like to a tenement or pelting farm. England, bound in with the triumphant sea, whose rocky shore beats back the envious siege of watery Neptune, is now bound in with shame, with inky blots and rotten parchment bonds. That England, that was wont to conquer others, hath made a shameful conquest of itself. Oh, would the scandal vanish with my life? How happy then were my ensuing death! End of Methinks I Am a Prophet New Inspired From King Richard II, Act Two, Scene One this recording is in the public domain. Enforced Thee from Henry the Sixth, Part Three, Act One, Scene One, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Enforced thee? Art thou king? And wilt be forced? I shame to hear thee speak. Ah, timorous wretch! Thou hast undone thyself, thy son, and me, and given unto the house of York such head as thou shalt reign but by their sufferance. To entail him and his heirs unto the crown, what is it but to make thy sepulchre, and creep into it far before thy time? Warwick is Chancellor, and the Lord of Calais. Stern Falconbridge commands the narrow seas. The Duke is made protector of the realm. And yet shalt thou be safe. Such safety finds the trembling lamb environed with wolves. Had I been there, which am a silly woman, the soldiers should have tossed me on their pikes before I would have granted to that act. But thou preferst thy life before thine honour. And seeing thou dost, I here divorce myself, both from thy table, Henry, and thy bed, until that act of Parliament be repealed whereby my son is disinherited. The northern lords that have forsworn thy colours will follow mine, if once they see them spread. And spread they shall be, to thy foul disgrace and utter ruin of the house of York. Thus do I leave thee. End of Enforced Thee From Henry the Sixth, Part Three, Act One, Scene One. This recording is in the public domain. Brave Warriors From Henry the Sixth, Part Three, Act One, Scene Four, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Brave warriors, Clifford and Northumberland, Come, make him stand upon this mole-hill here, That wrought at mountains with outstretched arms, Yet parted but the shadow with his hand. What? Was it you that would be England's king? Was you that revelled in our Parliament, and made a preachment of your high descent? Where are your mess of sons to back you now? The wanton Edward, and the lusty George? And where's that valiant crookback prodigy, Dicky, your boy, that with his grumbling voice was wont to cheer his dad in mutinies? Or, with the rest, where is your darling Rutland? Look, York, I stained this napkin with the blood that valiant Clifford, with his rapier's point, made issue from the bosom of the boy. And if thine eyes can water for his death, I give thee this to dry thy cheeks withal. Alas! poor York! But that I hate thee deadly, I should lament thy miserable state. I prithee, grieve, to make me merry, York. What hath thy fiery heart so parched thine entrails, that not a tear can fall for Rutland's death? Why art thou patient, man? Thou shouldst be mad, and I, to make thee mad, do mock thee thus. Stamp, rave, and fret, that I may sing and dance. Thou wouldst be feed, I see, to make me sport. York cannot speak unless he wear a crown, a crown for York. And lords, bow low to him. Hold you his hands whilst I do set it on. Ay, marry, sir, now looks he like a king. Ay, this is he that took King Henry's chair, and this is he was his adopted heir. But how is it that great Plantagenet is crowned so soon, and broke his solemn oath? As I bethink me, you should not be king till our King Henry had shook hands with death. And will you pale your head in Henry's glory, and rob his temples of the diadem, now in his life, against your holy oath? Oh, tis a fault too, too unpardonable! 
off with the crown, and with the crown his head, and whilst we breathe, take time to do him dead. End of Brave Warriors from Henry the Sixth, Part Three, Act One, Scene Four, by William Shakespeare. This recording is in the public domain. Now is the winter of our discontent, from Richard the Third, Act One, Scene One, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vin Riley. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York, and all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarums changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim-visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But I, that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking-glass, I, that am rudely stamped, and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph, I, that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world scarce half made up, and that so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. Why I, in this weak piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time unless to spy my shadow in the sun and descant on mine own deformity? And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain, and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Plots have I laid, inductions dangerous, by drunken prophecies, libels, and dreams, to set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate the one against the other. And if King Edward be as true and just as I am subtle, false, and treacherous, this day should Clarence closely be mewed up, about a prophecy which says that G of Edward's heirs the murderer shall be. Dive thoughts down to my soul. Here Clarence comes. End of Now is the Winter of Our Discontent From Richard the Third, Act One, Scene One. This recording is in the public domain.